Well, good morning. Welcome to Bethel Christian Reformed Church. My name is Justin Bailey. I teach theology at Dort University. It's a privilege to be back here with you uh, at what is quickly becoming one of my favorite places to preach. Um, Sunday is such a wonderful day. It's the end of one week and the beginning of another. It is our rhythm as God's people to rest and to reflect and to celebrate and to feast uh, together. Uh, First, remembering from the Old Testament that we can rest, we can stop our work, and uh, the, the, the universe keeps on running because God is in control. And then from the New Testament, remembering most importantly that this is the day we celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, which is the heart of all of our hopes, both in this life and the next. So will you join me as we pray together today? Almighty God, for many of us, this is a familiar place, and... It is a place where we have seen your face in your word. We've experienced your presence in song and prayer and fellowship. Lord, we don't want to take that for granted. We don't want to presume that you will always meet us in the same way, but we desire that you would, indeed, that you would do more than we ask or imagine today. So, Lord, with these humble words and songs and prayers, In readings, Lord, would it be that you would meet us by your Spirit in this place, and that those who are here that are struggling and stumbling and trying to hold on would receive the touch from you that they need, the words of hope that they need to hear, the encouragement of brothers and sisters of a family of faith. We pray that today would be a day in which we experience your grace filling us up so that we overflow as springs of living water to those who are needy. We offer this service to you with great joy, in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand for this call to worship from Psalm 104? Let us declare the greatness of God who fills this earth with his beauty. He set the earth on a firm foundation and nothing shall shake it. He blanketed the earth with oceans and covered the mountains with deep waters. He started the springs and rivers and sent them flowing among the hills. Men and women go out to their work, busy at their jobs until evening. He calls us to be his servants, caretakers of his entire creation. Oh, let me sing to the Lord all my life. Sing hymns to my God as long as I live. Let's sing together this opening hymn, God Himself is with us.
receive these words of greeting. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. God welcomes us in this place with his grace and love. We in turn welcome one another. So will you turn to those around you and greet them, especially those who might be here for the first time. have a seat. Come now to our time of confession. As believers in Jesus, I always like to say there are two types of things that we confess. We confess our sins and we confess our faith. Uh, But to confess our sins is to confess our faith, is to confess that we are more deeply flawed than we could possibly imagine, but we are also more deeply loved in Jesus than we could possibly dream. Tell God our sins is not to tell God anything that God doesn't know. But when we present our sins, our weaknesses, our struggles to the Lord, we present our hearts to the Lord. We offer ourselves to the Lord and we say, have your way in my life. So we're going to sing our prayer of confession, uh, this song, Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
Let's take a moment for silent confession as we offer ourselves to the Lord before we hear the words of assurance. Hear now these words of assurance from Psalm 103. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Let's sing now the fourth verse of the song as a hymn of dedication. Join me in prayer. Now, Lord, as we turn our attention to your words, speak for your servants who are listening. We pray that this would be more than words on a page, or words in the mouth of an ordinary man, but that we would hear your voice speaking to us. May the words of my mouth the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture text this morning is from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 28. We'll be reading verses 10 through 19. Genesis chapter 28. Starting in verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Bethel. Loves. This is God's word. There's a passage in the twelfth chapter of the Gospel of John where we meet Jesus in Jerusalem just before the crucifixion, and something happens as Jesus is teaching a noise. And this noise is experienced in three different ways by different people in the crowd. For one group, the phenomenon is entirely natural. It's just thunder, they say. Another group believes that something mystical has happened. An angel spoke to him. In other words, something happened, it was mystical, but we believe that it was for him and not for us. And finally, Jesus and the gospel author 
identify the sound as nothing less than the voice of God. And Jesus says, this voice came not for me, but for you. So there are the three experiences. Thunder, an angel, and the voice of God. These are not just three different interpretations, but three different experiences. Thunder, an angel, and the very voice of God. Why do different people experience the world in such different ways? Why do some people experience the world as bursting with God's presence and others hear nothing more than noise? And what are the ways that we have been trained to see or not to see, to hear or not to hear, to feel or not to feel? And how does the God of the Bible break through our dullness, through our numbness, through our insensitivity and make himself Known. Knowing God, after all, is not like knowing anything else. If you want to know something inanimate like a rock, all of the initiative is going to be on your part. The rock just sits there. It doesn't reveal itself to you. It It just is there. And you must do all the work to know the rock. Now, if you move up to an animal, it's a little bit more complicated, right? Because the animal can run away. Take the difference between a dog and a cat. A dog who wants to get to know you and a cat who doesn't want to have anything to do with you. For the most part. (laughs) When it's a human, it's even more complicated. And we could all probably tell stories of people that we might have been interested in getting to know. And they didn't seem that interested in getting to know us. My college students can relate to this. In fact, very important persons like celebrities... Politicians, stars, have handlers and security to prevent unsolicited access. And so if you're going to know that famous person, all of the initiative, almost all of the initiative is on their part. They must choose to open their lives up to you. And you can want to know them, but unless they choose these people who are above us, then there's no way to know them. Now, if that's the case with a very important person, how much more must it be the case with God, who is not only quantitatively but qualitatively different than us, the one who sustains our life, who holds our breath? If we are going to know God, God must take the first step. All of the initiative is on his side. Only God can reveal God. And that is exactly what God does. Few stories illustrate this better than our text, where we meet a man who becomes suddenly conscious of God's presence in an unexpected place. In this text, we find that God comes to us in ways that may be different than we expect, but that are better than we dream. And this epiphany, the opening of eyes and ears of our hearts, reveals a grace that is Unexpected and undeserved, unsolicited and unreserved. And when we wake up to this grace, even ordinary moments, ordinary places can begin to shine with God's presence. I want to organize the sermon this morning around two objects of attention that appear in our passage. A stone and a staircase. A stone... And a staircase. The first, the stone, is a portrait of restlessness. And the second, the staircase, is a picture of rescue. So let's take the first. The stone. And by this, I mean the stone that Jacob used for a pillow. Have you ever been that tired that you would take a stone and use a stone as a pillow? This is a picture of restlessness. One of my favorite lines in C.S. Lewis is the very first sentence of The Voyage of the Don Shredder. It goes like this. There once was a boy named Eustace Scrub, and he almost deserved it. And Jacob's name means conflict, deceiver, he cheats. And Jacob lived into the name. 
A heel-grabbing trickster, he scrambled and scrapped for blessing in the shadow of his alpha male brother Esau. After convincing his brother to sell him his birthright for a bowl of lentils, he went to great lengths to then impersonate Esau to make the theft complete, stealing father Isaac's firstborn blessing. And Esau responds to that grand larceny by declaring a blood oath to kill his brother as soon as his father passes. And so Jacob, the scrambler, the trickster, is obliged to put some distance between himself and Esau's vow of vengeance. And so he leaves his home, and who knows whether he will ever return. It will at least be the last time he ever sees the father from whom he has stolen the blessing. Now Jacob is really on his own. Estranged from his home and his family with nothing but his old, wily ways to help him survive in the wild of the world. And I wonder if some of us are or have been in a similar circumstance as Jacob. Carrying baggage, a checkered past, dysfunctional family history, scars from selfish decisions we might have made. We're not sure what the future holds or where we are headed and life feels like something to be survived by any means possible. And we're tired. We're tired. Like Jacob, ready to use even a stone for a pillow. You see, Jacob has been raised to worship the God of Father Isaac and Grandfather Abraham. This is the larger story that Genesis has been following. Abraham's family family through which God has promised to bring restoration to all of the scattered tribes of the earth. It's interesting that a couple of chapters later, when Jacob talks about God, he calls him the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac. He does this twice in chapter 31. We know comparatively little about Isaac's faith next to Abraham and Jacob. But perhaps it is telling that Isaac identifies God as the fear. Notwithstanding the fear or faith of his father, it would seem that Jacob lives his life by the dictum from poor Richard's almanac. God helps those who help themselves. For Jacob, the God that his grandfather followed and that his father feared, this God is far away, busy elsewhere. God who has left us alone to build cities and broker blessings by the sweat of our brows. And so he scrambles. He cheats. He does whatever he needs to do to get ahead at any cost, whatever it takes. Like so many of us. A while back, our family watched Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The Gene Wilder version, of course. There's no other version. If you're not familiar with the story, I'm about to spoil it for you, so you could put your fingers in your ears just for this part of the sermon. And a great candy maker invites five children to tour his chocolate factory, and one by one, each of the first four children misbehave and pay the consequences. Augustus Gloop falls in the chocolate river, Violet Beauregard is turned into a giant blueberry, Veruca Salt falls down the garbage chute. Mike TV gets shrunken down a few inches tall, and only Charlie Bucket remains at the end. And while we were watching this movie, my son, Benjamin, said to me, Dad, I do not want to go to this chocolate factory. Something might happen to me. And I said, Ben, you don't have to worry. You only have to worry if you do something naughty. Only the naughty kids had bad things happen to them. And Ben thought for a second and said, but I think I might do something naughty. That's good self-knowledge. We love to imagine ourselves as the good, the virtuous, the true, but we are so deeply implicated in evil already, both by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Regardless of what we say we believe about God, we often live as if God does not exist, or as if, if God does exist. God is far away, busy elsewhere with other things. And so we survive, we scramble and cheat, we ignore and excuse, unable or unwilling to see God's presence in the world around us or God's image in our neighbor. We are scramblers. 
We are Jacob. But in the Genesis story, indeed in the story of the Bible as a whole, it is to people like Jacob that God lowers a ladder. People sleeping on stones, but God lowers a staircase. And this is the second picture now, a picture of rescue. Jacob falls asleep on the stone and he dreams of a stairway to heaven. The text, in fact, elevates our gaze from earth to heaven with rapid interjections. There, a flight of steps, and look, angels, and look, the Lord himself speaking. God speaks, and when he speaks, his words are all grace and promise, reiterating his covenant with Abraham. Verses 13 through 15, I am with you, I will keep you, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Commentators point out the connection between Jacob's ladder, a sort of tower of stairs, and the earlier tower, Tower of Babel in Genesis 10. Two towers. The first tower, Babel, a ziggurat representing human attempt to ascend into heaven, to control the link between heaven and earth. But instead of them going up, God comes down in judgment, confusing their language, confounding their plans. But now here, 17 chapters later, we have a second tower, a second stair, not one of human making, but of divine design, a divine descent. Edmund Clowney writes, The stairway tower of Jacob's dream was God's answer to the Tower of Babel. God alone establishes communication between heaven and earth, and true religion does not come from man's quest but from God's intervention. Faith is not about manipulating God to do what we want. Faith is a response to God's gracious initiative. God takes the first step, reaching out to us before we reach out to him. Jacob isn't looking for God. He's simply trying to survive, to outrun his demons. He has no virtue, No moral fitness to draw God's attention. But God is not attracted by our beauty, but is driven by his love. Grace doesn't mean that God reaches out to us because we're pretty good, better than other other people around us. We are not. Grace means that God reaches out to us because he is good, because he is immeasurably generous. So if you are here, and you have not been seeking God, here is hope. If you are here and you have not been virtuous, here is hope. If you are here and you do not expect or deserve a staircase from heaven, here is hope. Because Jacob has not been seeking God, but God has been seeking Jacob. Jacob goes to sleep, and he wakes up in the same place. But when he wakes up, the world is different. The world is different. And so he says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. How awesome is this place, this, this ordinary place, is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. He had a moment like that where you realize that God was present even though you did not expect him or deserve him. Even after this event, Jacob is unwilling to give himself wholeheartedly to God. He still has a lot in his story. And yet grace is unleashed on him all the same. This epiphany is not a transformative moment. Jacob is still quite full of himself and will have to learn the hard way for decades He will bargain and wrestle for control of this relationship with God just as he does with all of his other relationships. He's not yet encountered the God who will give him a new name. He has not yet wrestled with a stranger who leaps out of the darkness to bruise him and bless him. But this dream, this epiphany, opens the door. It opens Jacob's imagination to a reality that was always there, but that he can no longer ignore. 
I like the word attention. Because it literally means to reach out. And yet it also has the sense of, of waiting. God gives us his attention long before we give him our attention. He reaches out to us. But there's also this sense in which God waits in attention for us to respond. And could it be that what you perceive as God's silence is the silence of God listening? Listening and waiting for you to respond, to speak, to respond to the invitation that he has already given you. Once we see this God who descends to meet us, who speaks, who shows up to communicate everything, everywhere has the capacity to be different from that moment on. And the rescue has begun. See, all of us have been trained to see and hear in a very particular way, and it can be so hard to get outside of that way of seeing. Our life experiences are bound up inside friendship circles and particular lines of conversation that can hold a lot of wisdom, but that are very local. And so how do we gain the capacity to see what we aren't used to seeing, to hear what we aren't used to hearing, to imagine what we aren't used to imagining, or to put it more pointedly, how do we open ourselves up to the reality and presence of grace in a world that often feels graceless? The theological answer, of course, is the work of the Spirit, divine and supernatural light imparted to the soul, shining out of the darkness, opening the eyes of our heart to see and respond to the grace that is given. But how does the Spirit do that? And the answer is that the Spirit works through ordinary means of grace, through Scripture and sacrament, through song and silence, through fellowship and prayer. And through these ordinary means of grace coming to this ordinary place, which it just occurred to me as I'm preaching that this place is called Bethel too, that, that in this place our hearts are trained, our eyes are trained, so that when we leave this place we begin to see God in more and more places. There are moments, like when a bit of light hits a droplet of water just right, or when a few lines of a song sets your heart on fire, or when your daughter reaches up and grasps your hand, that ordinary places can seem like the gate of heaven. And you say, surely the presence of God is in this place too. And I was not aware of it. How awesome is this place? You know, I found three things that have a profound ability to open up the imagination, to give new eyes and new ears, new categories. Beauty, pain, and friendship. When we're stunned by the beautiful, when we're broken open by pain, when empathetic love bridges seemingly untraversable gaps, we find ourselves suddenly able to see things we couldn't see before as if we had new eyes and new ears. And the Holy Spirit seems to work with particular power in these spaces, spaces of beauty, spaces of brokenness, spaces of friendship. Because in those spaces, we are compelled to let down our defenses and open our hearts. And maybe that's unsurprising, because in the gospel, we find all three. A Savior who comes in beauty and brokenness a friend to sinners, a bridge from heaven to earth. Jesus comes to us like to Jacob when we least expect him and when we least deserve him. In fact, early in John's gospel, Jesus will invoke Jacob's story to Nathaniel. When Nathaniel says, Nazareth, anything good can come from that backwater town of Nazareth. And when Nathaniel is amazed at the sort of person that Jesus is, Jesus says to him, you will see greater things than these. You will see the heaven opened and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What Jesus is saying is that what was promised all those years ago in Jacob's dream has become a reality in the incarnation. 
God Himself coming down the stairs. The Word becoming flesh and moving into our neighborhood. Scripture reminds us that things are not always what they seem. The things we think we see and hear always need to be called into question to break open the familiar so that perhaps by the Spirit, when others hear thunder, we hear the voice of God. And when others see a crucified Messiah, we see the Word made flesh to dwell among us. We see His glory full of grace and truth. Have you been broken open by the beauty of Jesus Christ? Simon Tugwell writes this, So long as we imagine that it is we who have to look for God, we must often lose heart. But it is the other way around. He is looking for us. And so we can afford to recognize that very often we are not looking for God. Far from it, we are in full flight from Him, in high rebellion against Him. And He knows that and has taken it into account. He has followed us into our darkness, and there where we thought finally to escape Him, we run straight into His arms. Our hope is His determination to save us. And He will not give in. God is present, not because you are looking for him and not because you deserve him. God is present because in his grace, he chooses to make himself known when we least expect him, when we least deserve him. And in place of Jacob's ladder, we see not a staircase, but a cross, a cross that actually covers the great divide. And in place of the stone pillow, we see another stone rolled away from the mouth of a tomb, a symbol not of restlessness, but of resurrection. That stone rolled away means rest, light, and hope. The release of our burdens. Holy imagination is cultivated as we look at Jesus and allow his beauty and brokenness to meet us in friendship and fellowship is the only bridge between heaven and earth. And when the lights come on, as we see his beauty and love, our eyes get brighter, and suddenly we begin to see him in more and more places. And the more you see him, the more you love him. And the more you love him, the more you see him. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, our prayer is that we want to see Jesus. In this place, in the gathered assembly of worship, but also as we leave this place, as we walk into lives full of complexity, and conflict, and sometimes chaos. In a world that no longer feels safe, a world that is wild, in which we are tempted to live by its rhythms, we long to see Jesus and to learn from Jesus how to be like Jesus. We pray, Lord, that as you move in our hearts by your Spirit, as you wait for us to respond to your initiative, that you would find in us faithful people who hear your call, who receive your grace, who lay down our reservations and follow you wholeheartedly, believing that the life you offer is better than anything that we could find in the world. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our ears. Fill our life with your love and presence so that we may draw others to see you as well and to see you clearly. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Will you stand for our song of response? Fill thou my life. join me in our congregational prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning as the congregation of Bethel Church in this building we call the house of God. But united to believers throughout the world, coming together in so many different buildings and so many houses of prayer and so many other ways and so many other means, but all with the same purpose to come and sit at the feet of our great God. As the psalmist explained in uh, Psalm 35, excuse me, Psalm 36, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. So, Lord, as broken and sinful people, we come before you again today to celebrate your unfailing love for us and to feast on the abundance of this house, the message of your grace poured out in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and guaranteed by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the message that was brought today by uh, Dr. Bailey, we thank you so much that he's been willing to fill our pulpit uh, throughout this past summer and and, and now again. And dear Lord, we just uh, thank you for him. We thank you for pastors throughout the world, in other churches, on mission fields, who are bringing your word in this day. And we just pray that many may come to know you and accept you as the savior of their life. Dear Lord, we pray for our own pastor, Pastor John, Mary Jo, and Anna. We ask that you'll bless them as they've been together with family, and we ask that you'll grant uh, rest and and fellowship and uh, safety uh, on their way home, and we look forward to seeing them again this week. Our dear God, you know every member of this congregation, and we lay before you each of their needs and their joys and their sorrows. We pray, dear Lord, for those who are still mourning the loss of loved ones. Uh, We continue to pray for the 
the Brenneman family and the Poise family, and now we stand with the, uh, the Bonamas in the death of uh, Elizabeth. We pray for uh, Rob and Willie and uh, Tony and Sue and their children. We ask that you give all who mourn um, a measure of your grace. And uh, may you also impart the comfort and the hope that only you can give in the light of eternal salvation. We pray as well um, and come alongside the Dork community in the loss of uh, the chairman of the Board of Trustees, Dave Haney. Uh, and we just uh, pray that you'll be with his family. Uh, just, just having a, uh, a grandbaby born and then, and then to be called to you. Uh, we just pray for that family as they grieve. We also ask that you'll sustain Denny and Gloria's granddaughter, um, Shana. We ask that you'll be with her as uh, doctors continue to find a, a cure to what's going on in her her body as well, and we just ask that you'll sustain her life and be with her, her parents and, and Denny and Gloria as well at this time. We also that, ask that you stand with uh, Murr and Bev as they wait on the results of Heath's uh, tests, and uh, Lord, we just pray for, for positive results in due time. We also will pray for Wanda. We ask that you'll continue to give healing to her uh, replaced knee, and uh, we just ask for speedy recovery that soon she can be back to her service here to us at Bethel. And we also thank you for those who have been willing to step in and fill her role while she's gone. Pray also uh, with Dave Hagland as he uh, prays for his brother-in-law who's been uh, diagnosed with double pneumonia and is in hospital. We ask that you'll uh, grant him healing as well. Today we also think of uh, Cheyenne Halsoff, uh, who was just recently diagnosed uh, this week with celiac disease. Dear Lord, we know many others suffer from that uh, as well, and uh, we just uh, pray for strength to handle the challenges that come from, uh, from this ailment. Lord, we also want to ask uh, for care and keeping over Jen Friends as she travels to the Getty Conference. We thank you for her service to us as Bethel, to, at Bethel as uh, our youth director. And we ask that that uh, conference may bless and enrich her as well. And Lord, we want to celebrate with those who are celebrating anniversaries and, and birthdays. Um, we pray for uh, those who have... Uh, You've been so faithful in their, in their marriages, and we just thank you for that. We also want to pray a blessing on our young peoples uh, and their leaders as they've been off uh, to a retreat, and we ask that you will have uh, blessed them as well as they've fellowshiped uh, with the, each other and uh, spent time in your word and in prayer as well. And Lord, we also, as we... Uh, Near the beginning of another school year, we want to pray for all of our children as uh, they gear up again for another year of learning. We ask that you bless their teachers and uh, administrators, and uh, we just ask that you'll bless this coming school year. Um, and dear Lord, we now just are so grateful for all the things that you've done for us and the ways that you are with us. And... Uh, Lord, we just ask that now as we give our gifts, that they may express the gratitude of our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus, our Savior's sake. Amen. Okay, our offerings uh, will be taken now. The first for uh, the Bethel budget and also the second for Christian education. Thank you.
when oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deep. Will you stand with me for a parting blessing? Both the last song, the song we just heard, and the song we're about to sing have this idea of walking, uh, walking with the Lord. And the idea of walking is something that we see all the way through the Bible, and especially in the wisdom literature. Uh, because the only way that you get anywhere worth going is by putting one step in front of another. So as we leave this place, we go to walk with the Lord wherever we go in all different times and all different places and rhythms that we're in. Uh, we have a parting blessing to remember that wherever we go, wherever we walk, we are under his care, under his blessing, and under his love. That the same God who has met with us here is the same God who walks with us now wherever we go. So we receive this blessing from Romans. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace as you trust in him, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.